So here we go, everyone. Uh, greetings. Um, on behalf of our founder and director, Phoebe Greenberg, it is an immense pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of the publication for Relations, Diaspora, and Painting. Uh, before we get started, let's acknowledge that the Phi Foundation for Contemporary Art is located on unceded Indigenous lands. Jojage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is the home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connection to the past, present, and future and our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. So this is a celebration of artists, writers, designers, copy editors, translators, publishers, all of the care and sweat equity and love that manifests itself in something like a book. <laughs> and we are truly grateful to you all. Um, thank you to the artists who agreed to be part of this exhibition and for your generosity towards this publication. You are truly the heartbeat. Thank you to the writers who accepted this assignment. It's clear in reading your words that you all made this much more than any assignment. There is a deep engagement and a sense that we're doing something really special together. Um, thank you to Leon of Feed for taking on the task and walking alongside us in the process in order to bring something fresh to the design. Um, an overall visual aesthetic it, that really captures the spirit of the contemporary diaspora in all of its multiplicity and flux, that's, that's not something that's so obvious. And I, I really wanna thank you for that. Um, thank you to the copy editors, translators, and proofreaders who labored with intensity and good humor as there is no one pass. <laughs> Thank you to Hermer, who published the book, Hannes, Rainer, and Elizabeth, for your enthusiasm since the beginning. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to work with you. Thank you to the staff at the Phi Foundation for your enduring dedication to everything we do, and we can't do any of this without you. Thanks, John. <laughs> Thank you. This is the person holding it all together. W wave to us, John, so we all know who you are. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> You're the person holding it all together and pushing it forward. Um, I greatly appreciate your diligence, your eye, and how you throw every fiber of your being <laughs> into making this all happen. We're so fortunate to have you on this team. Um, once again, I want to thank the artists for being part of this show and, and for going through this process with us, um, working with the, the writers um, so closely with such, you know, enthusiasm. And so I want to move on. But before doing that, if you have a glass or maybe a hand to make a peace sign or a thumbs up, I invite you now to raise it in honor of the launch of this beautiful book and to us all this is for all of us cheers cheers wow hey maya jessica shout out <laughs> we have to share i have to share hey rick jonathan oh my gosh dan you can feel free to, um, you know, this is going to be pretty casual. So if you want to um, put your cameras on, feel free. Uh, I think we're going to give you agency too over your own microphone so we can, and your, your mute so we can, we can chat together. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a reading. Um, we're going to have Leon talk a little bit about design and then John is going to do a little uh, unveiling um, and then we're going to have a conversation. We can, you know, anyone who feels like they'd like to share um, something about what the process or, um, you know, the writing, what, you know, it's meant to, to explore diaspora in this way, then, then that's what we'll do until we you just can't do it anymore. So without further ado, I would like to invite Emily Jen 
who's an artist um, originally from the Bay Area of San Francisco, who relocated to Montreal <laughs> to do her MFA, and a wonderful artist, uh, writer. She's worn a lot of different hats in, and so it's just felt really uh, natural to invite her to write the foreword to the book, and I would now invite her to read it for us all. Well, thank you to Cheryl, thank you to John, thank you to Leon and the whole team, because this is, I actually haven't seen the physical book yet, but I imagine that it is extremely beautiful because the show is extremely beautiful and it was such an honor to get to put some, some, some words into, um, to sort of wrap around all of these bodies of work. So uh, without further ado, I will jump in. One afternoon several years ago, when I was home visiting my parents in California, the doorbell rang. I opened the door to a little old lady holding a cardboard box. She said something in Mandarin, handed me the box, and unceremoniously left. I opened it and out wafted the odor of inks and rice paper, old brocade and mothballs, a bouquet that I can only describe as the infinite distance between here and the old country. The box contained several scrolls of my grandfather's calligraphy and a hand-bound book of my grandmother's watercolors. My grandparents had both been dead for decades. For those of us who live in diaspora, there are thousands of miles embedded in the word relations. I opened the book and looked at the pictures, familiar yet remote, and, ro and ro <laughs> unrolled the scrolls, which I couldn't read. Uh, language often doesn't survive the transplanting uh, since assimilation was the goal for many generations, including mine. As my English has gained dexterity, my first language, Mandarin, has dwindled to a vestigial stump. Images, however, are not contained by geography or lexicon. They can cross an ocean of water or an ocean of words and lose no legibility. Neither are they subject to the timescale of a human life, fragile walking bags of seawater and consciousness that we are. Perhaps that's why I wound up as an artist too. While my grandmother was a traditional Chinese painter, rendering birds and flowers in long lost landscapes, I became a sculptor. The things I make are ecosystems of a sort, equal parts awkward and magical. They operate under their own logic in which the human is largely subsumed into hybrids of flora and fauna, object and detritus. I see kinship and indeterminacy everywhere I look. Likely the result of residing in so many different places over the years, in monolithic cities and far out in the Bundu Gulf. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, or so they say in my parents' field of biology, meaning that the development of an individual embryo echoes the evolution of the whole species. Or to paraphrase, that one life contains within it all the history that had brought it to pass in the first place. My own trajectory has bounced around the globe like a lotto ball, taking me from California to the East Coast to the desert Southwest of the United States, then to South Africa and Oaxaca State and ultimately to Montreal. From here, I have traveled from Dawson City to Newfoundland, from edge to edge of this vast and beautiful terrain that some call Canada. If my grandparents' generation was the drawn bow that catapulted us out of the old country, our generation is the arrow, still flying towards some unknown future. Of course, mine is just one in a myriad of stories. There are as many narratives of diaspora as there are grains of sand on the beach. From a distance, they may present uniformity, but up close, they are a thousand mineral hues. Standing before the work in relations, this is what I see. Color and movement, the intimate gaze of strangers, the ground by other light under unfamiliar stars. I see the pantheon of gods who traveled here with us, fractured and then reformed into something new. And I feel my own edges blur a bit, staring into the stereoscopic overlap of two or more senses of the word home. At the end of the day, images persist. They arrive on your doorstep unannounced one fall afternoon in a cardboard box borne by an elderly woman with whom you share only fragments of a language. They tell us who we once were, but we may also use them to create our own hybrid likenesses for those who will come after us, for whom we will be the ancestors. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me read. <laughs> I always get, you know, I went reading it in my own head. You know, I got quite 
you know, for Clint, I would get very, you know, really bubble up. So thank you very much for that. Um, I would now like to ask uh, Leon Lu of Feed to walk us a little bit through his design for the book. Welcome, Leon. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Emily, for that uh, wonderful reading. Thank you all to the writers uh, who contributed to, obviously, the artists. Um, I have to say uh, that I unfortunately didn't get a chance to see the show. Uh, and I, with everything that's going on, I'm actually not sure that I will get the, the chance to see it in the end. So. Uh, this book is actually really important to me because it will be the only way that I get to experience the the um, this uh, in the entirety of, of uh, the the show. Um, I'm just gonna show you some pictures. This will be like kind of a I guess a virtual super virtual walkthrough of of the book uh, because I didn't even get to uh, handle the the real, uh, the final copy of the book either. But um, just to start off, um, I need to mention that uh, at Feed, uh, we're working on the, the branding of Phi. And uh, one of the um, uh, foundational elements of the brand is uh, a typeface that we, a uh, bespoke typeface that we uh, made for the brand and the book was actually kind of the first uh real test for this uh this uh typeface um i don't know how many people have seen this or not but uh this is actually what the uh cover looks like uh because it's a group show with um over 20 artists instead of focusing on one image to put on the cover uh, we made a kind of typographic illustration uh, combining all of the artist names um, and having them intermingle and come together and come apart uh, so bringing them in in relation obviously um, and when we open the book, we get a clue as to what the the color has uh, uh, the color showing through the the uh, typographic illustration at the front was. So it's kind of a, a an amorphous um, combination of of different colors just swimming together. And on the right side, the title page, I think that's actually the main graphic device that we use throughout, um, which is basically discrete typography, but incredibly spaced out um, to let the, the, um, the page uh, not only breathe, but also let things through. Um, <clears throat> it might get a bit more uh, evident later on. So uh, when we dive into the book, we have the front matter, uh, the, the text that uh, Emily contributed and which we have the pleasure to hear. Um, and the the text is fairly straightforward at this point. And again, um, the title page with the very spaced out uh, words. This is the, uh, uh, this is uh, Cheryl's text, obviously. And then we move into <clears throat> exhibition views. And this will be my only experience of the show. So, uh, playing with different scales and also uh, not only putting the artworks in relation to each other, but also the views of the artworks in relation 
to each other. And we get, um, we get to see, to, to do the round of the, of the show like this. And <clears throat> then that is um, bookended with the English version of uh, Cheryl's text. And after that, we get into the, um, the, uh, the, the artwork. And this is where it's a lot more apparent, where the title pages are very, um, very spaced out. And this is kind of um, a, a willingness to show kind of a permeability in, in the, uh, the content where we're letting a lot of space, um, we're, we're making for a lot of space so that things can go through them. Uh, so it's a white page, but at the same time, it'll be tainted by what you're seeing before and after. Um, the type is really pushed to the sides to let things uh, breathe through. And um, then we, we move into the, uh, the reproductions of the, of the artwork. And when we get into the, um, the essays, uh, we take a bit of a different approach where it's more of a flux, where the, um, the, the French text is uh, immediately followed by the English text. And then we have a pause again uh, to the, the next uh, um, artist work. So this was, uh, <clears throat> sorry, this is all done in an alphabetical order. Um, and there are different, uh, different setups to, to reflect different aspects of work. So there might be details and relations between different framings. Um, obviously different proportions. So it makes for quite a, a dynamic uh, layout, even though the system is quite uh, easily, uh, you know, it's very apparent. It's just a grid, but we're filling it with so many different things. And the title page is, like I said, uh, making it breathe and letting things through. I think was uh, an important uh, thing that we wanted to to emphasize. So, yeah, this is that's pretty much uh, the thinking behind the publication. It was really a pleasure to work on this to with the richness of of all the artworks and the the uh, essays, and to try and make something that's a whole, but that's also um, not a kind of universalist uh, erasing of all differences and making everything on a level playing field, but rather um, something that's more uh, porous and that can let the, uh, all of the differences come to the fore. So I'm doing like kind of a quick, uh, quick fly through. And we see that there are different um, kind of feelings that we get from the different uh, double spreads. And yeah, so that's, that was pretty much the, the rationale behind the, the, um, the layout of the, of the publication. And then it's just a, a question of, uh, you know, respecting the artwork and giving it the space that, uh, giving them the space that they need. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to exclude any of the, any of the artists. I'm going to go quickly through there. It's really great, Leon, because, you know, you, you, you know, without having had a lot of time for us to talk about all these ideas about multiplicity of voices and 
you know, giving the space to the work that on the page, because that's sort of the way that the layout of works in the space happened. It wasn't about, you know, whatever some uh, convention around uh, uh, categorizing works or, you know, putting all the landscapes together and whatever. It was really about what's the right space for the work to speak on its own terms. And, and, and you also did that. We never really talked about that. <laughs> You know, you, you just sort of, you know, you intuitively understood that that was sort of an, uh, an important aspect of, of, the, of, you know, sort of the thinking and doing, um, you know, with it, with a, with a, through a diaspora lens and, you know, thank you very much for that. Oh, it was really, um, it was really a wonderful thing to, to work on. And um, yeah, thank you for, uh, <laughs> For the richness of the content, actually, it's that, that was really the gift. I think. Well, you know, I have to just say, and I think John knows what what I'm talking about. Maybe we all do because sometimes there's a can be a struggle between form and function, and um, I'm really just happy that we didn't have that struggle here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to throw it over to my man, John Knowles, now to show you the thing, the objectness, <laughs> the thingness. Go ahead, uh, John. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, thanks a lot, Dale. Um, it was really, truly a pleasure to, to work with you on this uh, project. And uh, as Cheryl's already um, alluded, there's so many... Um, so many small parts that make up the whole of uh, a book production and you're super um, patient and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and I think your craft to your, your, your approach to your craft has uh, been truly inspiring and, uh, and you. as, and your colleagues as well at feed. So um, yeah, it's been fantastic. So I appreciate all of your hard work. Um, Je tiens à remercier Cheryl aussi pour uh, sa vision curatoriale et éditoriale de livre. Um, pour tous uh, ceux qui n'ont pas encore vu l'exposition, j'espère que nous pourrons uh, bientôt rouvrir. Uh, crossing our fingers that we'll be able to do that. Um, uh, mes sincères remerciements vont également à tous les auteurs qui ont contribué des, des textes excellents et très stimulants. Et j'estime qu'il s'agit d'une toute nouvelle contribution au sujet des études de la diaspora et de la peinture dans son ensemble. Uh, je tiens également à remercier notre excellente équipe à la rédaction, Edwin Jensen, Casey Hawk, Tess Fragulis et Nathalie de Blois qui ont fait une lecture très engageante, tout en permettant à toutes les voix des auteurs à rester autonomes, réelles et inspirantes. Um, I'd also like to thank our amazing translators, Colette Touga, Marilyn Van Hoof, Jean-Louis René, Michael Gilson, and Josephine Denis, who were extremely uh, rigorous and maintained a very strong fidelity to uh, the texts that were in their original uh, mother tongue. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank uh, my immediate colleagues at Fondation Fi, Dahlia Chang, Victoria Carrasco, Greer Edmondson, Marie-Fay Deguier, uh, Marie-Hélène Demer, Daniel Fisset, Tana Gomez, Michelle Ouillette and Scarlett Martinez. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, it's, it shows that there's a, a it takes a, a big team to pull this off and uh, everyone's contribution was extremely uh, uh, strong and, uh, and, and even during this kind of crazy time, uh, very focused and uh, and so I'm, I'm very much thankful for, for everybody's work. So without further ado, um, I've not actually practiced this. Um, and I don't know if 
we were joking uh, as we were planning the launch that I would try to do sort of ASMR sort of unwrapping kind of shtick. Um, so I'll, I'll try, but I, my mic is maybe not close enough. So uh, <laughs> yeah, just lean in like that. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got the cellophane. Uh, let's go slowly. Peel off. You can do that even slower. Can everyone see this? Okay. Um, and yeah, it's quite amazing. Uh, our publisher, um, of course, uh, Hermer in Munich, um, were of course super professional and um, extremely um, collaborative in this whole production. And um, we just received copies like two days ago. Um, we had a rush group that came in um, expedited and. So soon you'll be able to receive those copies for the contributors who participated. Um, I think maybe Leon didn't really go over it, but the, this is a hard case publication. So um, one of the things that was quite beautiful that they um, inserted into the design was this emboss of the title, the Lation. Uh, which is quite nice and not very easy to, you can kind of see that, I think, kind of reflected. There's a nice sort of subtlety there that's actually keeping with our previous publications that also employ a, an emboss treatment. Um, and then this is the end paper, end sheets that Leon was showing. It turns out extremely Beautifully. Uh, in, is it in buttery, print. John? Is it a buttery paper? Um, yeah, you could say oh, that. There's some. Um, it's uh, the paper is actually uh, a Scandinavian paper um, called Munkin, and it's very. Uh, it's got a nice texture, and but it's it holds the colors really nicely. Um, and so it actually almost looks like a, a satin kind of uh, like it, the way that the colors ripple on the surface of the paper. You can kind of see through where there, there would have been like a, the adhesive that holds it. And there's a texture that you kind of pick up. And it, I'm only seeing it now with light hitting it. It's not something I don't think anyone was expecting. And the papers, you can still smell the ink which is, I think, always, you know, quite a fun thing to do when you first get a new book. So uh, I'll just flip through here. It's so funny because um, on my Instagram, I follow a lot of music fans and particularly jazz music fans. And um, there's this one particular guy who's started doing these videos where he's like fetishistically showing the laminate covers of jazz albums in his videos. And I'm starting to feel like it's rubbing off on me a little bit, but, um, so, uh, and you, and there's like a good heft, right, John, even though it's not yeah. heavy, it, it's no, not it's like, got a, it's got a, f a nice uh, volume to it for sure. It's, it's um, I mean, when we were talking about the early stages of the planning of the book, um, that was one of the things that we kind of bumped up against when we we're, you know, when you imagine the thing ahead of time, it's very hard and that, and Leon's contribution was extremely important to, to help clarify these things because you have it kind of the intention and then what's really the challenge in book production is like meeting that sort of like uh, outcome. So intention and outcome kind of meeting is always the, 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 the balance that's uh, hard to achieve sometimes, I suppose. And um, 
yeah, we were talking for a long time about the page count and it wasn't accurate according to the volume of text and, um, but it's turned out to be 200 and, um, 220 some odd pages and it, yeah, it feels really good. And, um, you know, there's no wasted space, which is, I mean, that's also the thing too. It's like extremely, extremely economical in the volume of contributions and the volume of artworks. And I think that comes through. So. That's cool, John. Should Would we do you another just, test? Yeah, just give another little like riffle <laughs> those pages. And then maybe um, if you could, if you could, uh, oh, I have a list too, but I really want to thank all the writers as well. Yeah, of course. I mentioned their names, would be really nice. Yeah. So I'll go through, we'll go through the table of contents. There's quite a few, there's quite a bit of back matter. <laughs> yeah, there is a fair bit of back matter, but I'll start with the, the um, as Leon was mentioning, it's, we elected to go with uh, alphabetical order uh, with the artists, um, which is not following the logic necessarily of the show as you were also mentioning but um so emily in the front matter emily's uh forward then phoebe has a uh a, a, a kind of a, an address and then it goes to your essay cheryl right, right. um then into the main kind of uh body of the book uh Hera chan wrote a text on larry achiam pong Eunice Validal wrote on Hervin Anderson. Rahel Ema wrote on Camru Zaram. Dominic Fontaine wrote on Fairley Baez. Sarah Nesbitt wrote on Frank Bowling. Robin Simpson wrote about Cy Gavin. James Oscar on Barkley L. Hendricks. Eunice again um, contributed a text by, uh, on Lubaina Hamid. Tracy Valcourt wrote on Barty Kerr. Diane Gistel wrote on Morija Katinge Banza. Tamar El Sheik wrote on Rick Long. Josephine Denis wrote on Manuel Mathieu. Tracy contributed another text on Julie Moretu. Kaylin Wilson Goldie uh, contributed on Jordan Nassar. Hera Osterweil wrote on Yoko Ono. Joseph Legaspi wrote on Maya Cruz Pelelio. Yanaya Lee wrote on Rajni Pereira, Paul Zitz on Ed Pian, Janice Sapigal wrote on Shanna Strauss and Jessica Sabagal, Mojan uh, Bezadi wrote on Curtis Santiago, uh, Marissa Largo on Marigold Santos, Josephine uh, wrote on Shinka, Yinka Sonabare, uh, Adrian Johnson on Shanna Strauss, Hera. Uh, again, contributed text on Micheline Thomas, Joseph Henry on Salman Tour, and Rachel Spence on Hajra Wahid. Finally, Jonathan Shaughnessy uh, wrote a text on Ginny Yu. So that is the full list of contributors. And um, yeah, just amazing work that everyone brought forward to, to this project. So thank you to everybody. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> So now is the time that we have a cocktail party. <laughs> and um, uh, Dahlia, if you, if you let us all kind of open our mics, then who, you know, we have artists here as well. I, I want to thank, you know, the artists and writers and, fr you know, friends who joined us. Um, you know, Rick Leong, hello. <laughs> Joseph Henry, this is great. Jonathan, Diane, James. It's just, this is really fun. Maya's here. Um, Ed I, is, is in there somewhere, I think. And Johan, yeah, Dominique, Johannes is here. Robin Simpson. It would be just, you know, really nice to see you um, if you're, no pressure, <laughs> no <laughs> pressure to, but um, if you do, if should you want to, I thought we could just have a little open conversation 
Oh, Ed Pien. Okay, cool. I'm getting a drink first. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought it would be really fun for us to do what we can um, and exchange a little. If anyone feels like they want to talk a little bit about um, what it was like to, to write, um, to contribute and, and get to know artists that, you know, they've known, but and, and to make that connection, I would, you know, really love us to be able to do that. It's like really open and free. <laughs> Can I? Uh, <laughs> yes. So I, hey, how's it going, man? <laughs> Good, great. Good Thanks. And uh, congratulations. I mean, everyone, it's amazing. But I, I just wanted to say, because what I was thinking with that, John, and also Leon, we haven't met, but I'm going to insist on every uh, book launch for the National Gallery of Canada that this level of detail is impressed upon. Every page, the quality of the paper, I love it amazing so really really enjoyed this it looks so wonderful yeah that's all that's great john how to be a part of this it was awesome to have you you know join us what was what's sort of really cool too about this project is that it it brings a lot of um you know it it it, it doesn't care about um frontier you know it doesn't care about um uh, or it wants to transcend, I think, the idea of nation. I think that's really important um, right now, and I and I really love that. Um, I like how we 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 were indifferent to that as well. We under we are not indifferent to the context because the context inform a lot of us and a lot of how we have to operate. But in terms of transcending, in order to do stuff like this, that was pretty nice. Hey, Maya. Hey, Cheryl. How are you? Hi, everyone. This is amazing. I love the detail of the, all going into the book. My God, I wasn't expecting to <laughs> really have such a tactile experience. And it's wonderful, the readings and everybody who worked on this. Thank you so much. We can't wait to get a copy out to you. Are you in, are you, you're in Brooklyn now? You're not, did you, you didn't, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, still, still here. Yeah. yeah. I can't wait to smell the ink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and jo but Joseph isn't with us tonight. Is he? Is he in the Zoom too? He, or he couldn't make it tonight. Okay. He, he really wanted to, but um, he, he's teaching a class I think right now. So. Yeah. Oh, understood. Understandable. A poetry mm -hmm. class. <laughs> okay okay well it, i mean his text is really wonderful and and um i'm hoping that at some point you know we'll get him up we'll get him up here up here yeah, to Montreal. Too bad. yeah yeah he want we wanted to come together but uh didn't yeah. do it didn't <laughs> <laughs> uh, and joseph hello is this my cue hi <laughs> <laughs> um, hello. Hi. Hi, I had the pleasure of speaking with Salman actually last week and uh, yeah, uh, so I kind of, you know, channeled a little bit of you um, in, in our interview because um, I thought you contributed so much to, you know, another, my understanding too uh, of his work. So thank you so much for your contribution. Yeah, thank you. It's nice to be back. Speaking of Frontier, I mean, I went to undergraduate in Montreal and now I live in New York. So it's also, it's nice to be brought back into the orbit of, I knew it as DHC, but now it's, <laughs> yeah. it's that's, um, that's how far I go back. Um, yeah, thanks. And how are you doing? Me personally? Yes. Um, well, <laughs> all, things, all, all things considered, I mean, as well as can be said, which is, um, you know, there's a, yeah, I guess if there's certain parameters are met in your life related to your health and your stability and your housing, then I think you're by most yeah. people, good to go. Um, and I and I am, yeah, yeah. And you're busily writing away and and um, working on lots of different things. Yeah, I just started at MoMA this year, so I'm back in the museum world, um, which is a which is a curious institution these days. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say the belly of the beast in many ways. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, there's the first thing that I was thinking of this, the conversation we're thinking about tonight, and the first thing I have in mind is like, what are the loan forms gonna be like? Thanks to the pandemic, first thing I thought were these like very um, 
kind of tangible concrete issues about painting and diaspora. Because um, I don't know about your institution, but now, I mean, even the sheer act of shipping the material object called a painting, right, has been totally complicated. Um, not just by the pandemic and the kind of health issues, but about the economy of the art world, right, it's being adjusted in kind of real time. Um, so I think it, it kind of forces the question that I know the show is addressing, which is why is painting a good medium to talk about diaspora? Um, especially now where it's, it's, it's liability as a physical object is so pronounced, right? Um, compared to the digital image, which is absolutely mediating all of our interactions. So it, it, it's now the kind of question of medium is actually, it's an old question, but it's come back in a very kind of urgent way right now, which is interesting. I mean, that's a great, uh, I, I like this, I like this idea. I've got some thoughts. Does anyone have, want to, you know, have any thing they, you know, comments or response to that? I mean, because it's tr it's, it's so real now. That there's all these kind of talks about, we can't, we can't really entertain um, shows where we have to bring physical objects from, you know, from far and wide. Uh, and, and it's even getting really difficult now to become insured, <laughs> to seek additional insurance. So I don't know, I throw it out. You, or I throw it out on your behalf. You throw it to me and I throw it out. I can mute myself. <laughs> I, I could uh, weigh in on that idea of why, why painting might be an important way to talk about diaspora. And Hello, I think- Hello, Rick. Hi. <laughs> For me, um, I think this about this idea of visual literacy and its ability, like everyone is more visually literate in this time. And it's that visual language can transcend uh, other kinds of language barriers. It can transcend uh, other kinds of borders and limitations. So that, that image like um, Leon, when you're talking about that kind of porousness, that, that ability to be open, at the same time, I think uh, the painted image has that ability to do that. Anyway, just playing in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Because, um, you know, there are always going to be, and there should be uh, dialogic um, responses to, to any cultural offering. And, and one of such, those uh, responses was an interesting review, which, posited in my estimation because I read it five times trying to figure out what was really going on but that painting was sort of somehow not considered maybe the best way to talk about or the best lens through which to explore diaspora and I I mean of course was I don't know I of course disagree and, and we all would but I mean it's still interesting but I because painting is such a is one of those one of those um, ways, and we see that in the show, there's just so many ways to think about painting um, and, and contemporary practices have exploded the uh, uh, narrow uh, definitions of what painting means. And so I found that kind of funny, <laughs> kind of an odd um, way to interpret, you know, painting and diaspora as being somehow not I don't know. I was like, what would this person, what, what are they thinking is better video or I, I wasn't really sure. And, and, and I have to also say that, um, through my discussions with all of you and the more that I think, you know, and I, and I've with invariably I've had this discussion with some of you about, um, your work, you, you know, sort of work in abstraction and, um, pictorial or, uh, you know, something more figurative and, and I don't even care. I don't even think that we should be talking that way anymore. I, I don't even know the more I, the more I think about these, the more I think they don't hold any water, you know, these kind of ways of identifying, you know, sort of ways of, of looking at your painting practice. Anyway, I done. Someone else talk. I have something to say to that. Just this idea of, because I look a lot, um, I, I study visual culture and, and I've become very interested lately uh, in uh, topics of disinformation and machine learning. And then I start to think a lot about this idea of naming and of categorization and, and who gets to put those titles to things and, and then how people are supposed to, or things are supposed to be grouped in 
to those different kinds of categories and and that you know more and more it becomes this kind of articulations of quantifying and of rating and of you know trying to make kind of estimations on on future behavior of people or what have you and so it just it's made me just think all of these kind of categories that has you know that goes over into art into these kinds of conversations too and and you know when you had said in the in the review that it was decided that maybe painting wasn't the way and then i was like well okay yeah so what 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 is that way and and according to who and you know like mm -hmm. it, yeah that's that's my two cents i mean you're totally entitled to you know everyone's entitled to an idea and opinion and whatnot but i guess i i just wanted more it's like well, what do you really need you know tell me what you want <laughs> You know that history that that western art history you know that that there's been certain categories that have really you know kind of led the way that we're supposed to understand and and uh you know group things and and yeah. we start to get these kind of categories and maybe this is all starting to unravel a little bit now and you know yeah uh, yeah you heard something yeah jonathan well, just to, I don't want to, but I'm just think I this question of painting uh, is also, and I'm thinking about Frank Bowling and your the exhibition Cheryl decision to include Frank Bowling. Also, I mean, I wrote about Ginny Yu, who is engaged always with modernism, and I've just been thinking about painting. I mean, if we're looking only at contemporary, but if we want to unpack, I hope, and I think the global through the modern, which is in need, and decentering that then we really are thrust into a dialogue, I think, with painting that extends well beyond, of course, those Western dialogues. And I think that that's, that's maybe, to me, where painting maybe still resonates up into the present. And I just wanted to kind of put that out there, maybe for also some of the painters in the, in the room. But, you know, I just think as a medium, if it's, um, you know, like so many of these questions now when, within art history, at least I'm interested in uh, the foundations of those when we extend beyond the West, going back to modernism, right? And going back to 19th into the earlier 20th century. Um, and a lot of those dialogues are rooted, certainly, I guess, sculptures there too, but a lot of those would be rooted in in painting and thinking about um, how important that's been also to practices as those extend forward. So that's just a thought to throw out there. And I wonder, Cheryl, maybe in your thinking, because I haven't read uh, like the but you know thinking about that inclusion of because I think it's contemporary but then you've got uh, you were, I come back to like Frank Bowling who extends a whole oh, you know yeah. a whole spectrum right and it's so foundational and so maybe um yeah just curious about that that inclusion too maybe yeah I, I think it, it was really com coming down to uh his questions and and how he has um had an interesting experience being sort of you know born in uh uh what what is at the time british Guyana, and then you know being you're know, going to school and uh art school in, in in london and then feeling that there was sort of some limitations you know to his practice and also being you know really clear about the striations you know of of what it means to be an artist of color at that time and how you get put in boxes and how he got put in his own separate category instead of just being you know uh accepted as you know part of artists working in um you know sort of a modern modernist tradition he got he got his own category by himself <laughs> and what that did you know to isolate him you know with apart from a canon that you know seemed to go on and and be and become part of it um you know, this, this is diaspora experience you know and then to go to and then to feel like okay i need to find a place where i feel i can grow more and and have more freedom and then to go to new york and then you know to you know land within that interesting group at the time that he did it just it just seemed like okay well what can that what can that tell us or how can that contribute you know through time um that experience in diaspora so that was what was behind that really simply james how's it going man i'm chilling <laughs> <laughs> so so it, it's funny because it, it's like 
this kind of archaeology of knowledge, we're talking about Frank Bowling, you know, we're talking about really sort of, you know, re-diving into that archaeology of knowledge. And actually, when you think about it, I mean, um, th there's that amazing uh, video of him talking about um, how the tape was, was kind of framing him, even though he was, there was a show going on and he felt very uncomfortable about his framing which seemed to be more around his identity uh, rather than the work. Um, so I'm a West, I'm West Indian. I'm, my family's from Trinidad and uh, Guyana is a very specific place uh, because it's, it's part of it is in the Amazon and it has this, this geopolitical um, centrifuge, which is, uh, which probably could predict the rest of the 20th century. Uh, Guyanese politics was always divided between people of African descent and Guyanese descent. And the CIA came to Guyana and they, they used that to sort of uh, divide the population up. So that's one part of Guyana. And I'm just saying this because I want to really just uh, add something to Frank Bowling ta talking about him and also talking about painting and why are we only seeing Frank Bowling now? So that's mm -hmm. the first thing. You have the geopolitical cleavage, which is both uh, through empire and also through race and, and colonialism and all that. The second thing is Guyana is a frontier town. It's like a nowhere land, right? Up until recently, there's a lot of gentrification going on there. And the third thing is the Amazon. So there's a writer named Wilson Harris, who is, I guess, somebody you would consider like the prose version of Frank Bowling, right? So Wilson Harris, um, uh, who passed away very recently, he was a mentor of mine. Wilson was considered one of the best writers after James Joyce in the English language. And I think if people have never heard of him now, they probably say, why haven't I heard of him, right? So what's interesting with Wilson Harris is that he got published and Faber and Faber, one of the most reputable uh, publishers in, in, in the world and in England, what they did is they published all his books throughout his life, but, but it was almost like they created a, a house for him and he remained in that house. He was sort of like this abstract writer who nobody could understand, but he had a place. So one of the things that I'm thinking about is painting, because at least Wilson Harris had his, his place. He had a voice in the West, but Frank Bowling seemed to be remain in obscurity, almost like the jazz in his work was too much, like the scream in his work was too much. So can we say that maybe people are a little nervous about painting and painting coming from the diaspora as the real expression of the scream. And maybe, I mean, the piece by Frank Bowling in the show is one of the best paintings I've seen in my life. And the, the thickness of it, the, um, the, the sort of, um, uh, I mean, it, it's, 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 it, it, it's painting something that maybe the West is scared of to see now coming because that will complete the scream, you know? Mm. Look at the work of Cy Gavin in the show. It's fucking spectacular. Anyway, that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, thank you, thank you, James. That's such an interesting idea. And I would love mm. to just, I mean, pivot because you mentioned Cy, just to say hi to Robin Simpson, who wrote the essay on Cy's work. Hey, how you doing, Robin? You don't, you don't have to unmute if you, okay, hey. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Cheryl, hi, John. Hi, hey, Robin. How is it for you to just, you know, did you know Sai's work before we, we, we thrust you two together? <laughs> no, it was my first encounter with his work. And yeah, um, we're hoping, you know, that, that uh, I don't know if, I think, ever, does everyone know about Calgary, John? Uh, no, I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> it's a secret still. <laughs> Is, okay, well, I don't think I can, you know, not say now. No. Um, <laughs> this is maybe a good a forum as any to let everyone know that 99.9% um, uh, the show will go to the Esker Foundation in Calgary in May and they will take a slew of books <laughs> and spread the good news. 
Um, and so it would be in May, I think. Uh, yep. That's what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And yes, so we're really thrilled. We're really thrilled that the show can, can go on and have more life. Um, even though we are facing the possibility that we may not be able to reopen the show. I mean, it's all, you know, something that we're all kind of trying to get our heads around, you know, uh, the show will have had uh, something like two and a half months, you know, sort of open to the public, which is a tragic in some ways and makes it a unicorn in some ways. And, but, but it, the fact that it will, it will go out to the prairies is really wonderful. So we're very, very happy about that. <laughs> Josephine, ça va? Uh, oui, ça va et toi? Hi, everyone. Yeah. I came late, so I'm not sure uh, if everyone introduced themselves or not, but I'm very happy to be here. Josephine, you wrote on Yinka Shanavari. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wrote on uh, Yinka and Manuel Mathieu. Um, this was, I was actually very excited to write on Yinka and then uh, you showed me the work, I think, John, and I was like, oh, this was not <laughs> what I'm usually, what I'm used to and what I studied um, in art history, but it was, yeah, it was an incredible experience. I think it was a very new way um, for me to engage with, um, you know, his practice. And, and I feel like it, in that way, you were just saying unicorn. I feel like this series is a unicorn. It's really not what he usually does. And um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's true. For, the, for, for folks who know, you know, Yenke Shanavari's past work, the sculptures, always using the conceptual device of the um, Dutch wax fabric, um, sometimes in paintings, he he uh, made a quilt. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, he did. He made a quilt. And I mean, some of the Dutch wax print makes an appearance in there, but I feel like it was in that way. Like, I love that you chose that for this painting um, show because just in the composition itself, it was very much... Um, a painting just in the the way that he narrates the scene and to me that was an extremely um just unique commentary on you know the that medium itself and the type of uh visual um identity makers that are sort of embedded and perpetuated by it um and just the way that he undoes that not only with um, the content, but just the way that things are seen together and look undone and sort of um, there's an undoing and the way that um, he puts mm -hmm. the collage together um, and just that beautiful balance was, yeah, it was incredible. I actually haven't seen the show yet, <laughs> which is terrible because I'm based in Montreal, but I was traveling uh, the last few months um, during COVID, but I hopefully I'll see it. Um, well, let me just put it out there right now because, you know, in a staff meeting, John was joking that this is the best time to see the show is like right now. So anyone who is in Montreal and want or, gonna, or can get to Montreal, we'll get you, we'll let you see the show. <laughs> It's a shame not to. It's all up. It's beautiful, and and yeah, we that would be awesome to just make let that happen. Yeah. And and you also wrote on on Manuel's work, which I find to be a very difficult thing to write about. Yeah, it is. I mean, my 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 uh, way of approaching his work was to sort of tell the story of what it is to experience his work rather than analyze it as an art um, historian, because I feel like his work is, yes, it's political and it's contextual and, you know, embedded in very specific Haitian visual um, languages, but it's, 
it forces you to um, engage on a personal level and to own up to what you bring to it because a lot of his work um, seems, you know, you were talking about the fact that speaking about work in abstract or figurative terms almost feels irrelevant in this moment. Um, but with his work, it you're forced to, to, to trouble these concepts because some works really do look abstract or figurative when they're not at all. Um, and that sort of activates your imagination in a way that um, you usually wouldn't have to, you know, like for a passive viewer, you really do have to become quite active um, to figure out what it is that you're looking at. Um, and so to me, that felt extremely important in the context of Haiti, um, not only from history, but just the context in which we find ourselves right now, which is just, you know, complete chaos, but, but a chaos that a lot of us feel is necessary and a chaos that is brought about by the people as a way to, um, you know, like clean control, basically. And Manuel's work does that. It is, it's, it's, you know, it is intentional chaos um, in this way to sort of subvert any sort of uh, category um, and to merge and sort of melt different cultural um, references and influences, um, which in a way feels a lot like Creole, right? And and the ways in which we use language and sounds and intonations as a way to try and grasp the different things that we can't quite put a word on because we live them so um, intensely in the moment and it's sort of catching up with the future is what we're always doing because we're so innovative and we're so transformative and we're always building a future that we don't really quite understand um, or no, but we're doing it. We have to on a daily basis. That's how we've gotten to be um, who we are as a people. And I feel like his work definitely is that experiment over and over. So that's what I was trying to do with my text. Uh, it was very <laughs> experimental for me, but it was fun. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I thank you so much for everything you just said. Of course, thank you. Euh, J'aimerais faire le pont avec Diane et, et je pense que Morija est là aussi, hein? Oui, je suis là, je suis là, on retourne, je suis là. <rire> ah, je, te vois. Je, je pense que vous pouvez peut-être, je ne sais pas, si vous avez envie, ben, je, étant donné qu'on a une artiste et une écrivaine qui sont euh, ici dans le même espace, euh, comment c'était euh, pour vous... Euh, je, de, de travailler, en, ben je, vous n'avez pas travaillé ensemble, mais euh, c'est quand même un euh, euh, une, une dialogue. Mm -hmm. Est-ce que tu veux débuter, Moridia Tu veux dire quelque chose <rire> Mais, euh, en fait, comment, attends, comment est-ce que je veux dire ça En fait, moi, je, quand Cheryl m'a invité pour l'expo, déjà, bonsoir tout le monde, hi everybody, I'm sorry. <rire> Uh, another meeting on Zoom. <laughs> for to come here, but I will speak in French because English is not, uh, it's not perfect for me. I'm so sorry if uh, if I may. Yes. <clears throat> Et euh, en fait, pour moi, quand j'ai rencontré Diane la première fois, elle, elle est beaucoup dans la littérature et elle a une façon de penser et d'écrire qui m'intéressait beaucoup parce que euh, elle est d'origine haïtienne d'origine haïtienne en fait, mais elle a grandi en France. Moi, je viens d'un pays d'Afrique du Congo. On a été colonisé par la Belgique, mais j'ai une culture française, donc on se comprenait quand même facilement. Mais au-delà de ça, elle a été aussi en Afrique et elle a été au Congo. Donc du coup, euh, elle connaît l'histoire africaine. Donc elle a une, elle a pour moi, elle avait une vision afro-descendante, mais aussi caraïbé, euh, caraïbéenne, européenne et américaine parce qu'elle vit ici. Et les questions que moi je traite, qui sont euh, des questions de territoire, euh, 
vu toutes ces questions politiques et je trouvais que elle avec la littérature je trouvais que ça que ça allait bien donner qu'elle écrive un texte pour moi et puis je sais qu'elle est très rigoureuse elle écrit un texte et puis elle le corrige dix fois même si tu lui dis que c'est très bien <rire> donc du coup euh, c'est comme ça que je voulais euh, vraiment travailler avec elle et donc là je vais te laisser bien me dire euh, pourquoi tu as voulu travailler avec moi <rire> Ah, bonsoir à tout le monde, je suis vraiment désolée, pareil, je, suis, euh, je, je comprends parfaitement l'anglais, mais je suis une francophile et francophone euh, dure, euh, et, et du coup c'est plus simple pour moi de parler euh, en français. Euh, et en fait, ouais, moi c'était un plaisir de travailler euh, avec, euh, avec Moridja, puis quand il m'a euh, parlé de, voilà, de l'écriture liée à son œuvre, j'étais vraiment ravie parce que, euh, effectivement, moi, dans mon travail de mémoire, euh, moi, je suis en littérature, puis je travaille sur le lieu de mémoire. Et en fait, euh, dans, son, dans sa démarche et même dans, dans, son, euh, dans son travail artistique, il travaille énormément sur ces enjeux liés à la mémoire, au territoire. Puis c'est des choses qui sont vraiment similaires avec ce que moi, j'explore à travers euh, le roman haïtien. Et du coup, il y avait tellement une, une connexion, une facilité. Et bien évidemment, comme il expliquait, il y a notamment... Euh, à mon origine, il est notamment à, mes, à mon intérêt, il est notamment à mes voyages. Et en fait, euh, d'être face à, à l'œuvre de Moretja, pour moi, il y avait quelque chose de, de l'ordre quasiment d'une évidence. J'ai l'impression qu'il n'y avait rien à décrypter, il n'y avait rien à, à surréfléchir. C'était quelque chose d'évident et qui faisait tellement écho à ma réalité, tellement écho euh, à mon vécu, tellement écho euh, euh, aussi un petit peu au questionnement que j'ai eu dans ma vie. Et du coup, il y avait quelque chose de, de, de très fort et de... de de, je ne sais pas, il y avait comme quelque chose d'une espèce de connexion euh, à, face à son œuvre et même de façon de son travail de façon générale. Et en fait, moi, ce que j'ai adoré dans, dans, dans l'écriture de, de ce texte, c'est qu'on s'est rencontrés. Du coup, j'ai été dans son atelier euh, et on a parlé vraiment longuement. Donc, c'était vraiment, j'ai l'impression que ce n'est pas un texte que j'ai écrit, c'est vraiment un dialogue. Euh, en fait, finalement, c'est juste Moridja qui a écrit le texte euh, d'une certaine façon, mais on a vraiment beaucoup discuté. Bon, je l'ai vraiment saoulé, je dirais même, j'ai presque harcelé, euh, euh, parce que j'avais vraiment besoin de comprendre euh, vraiment ce qu'il ressentait, no, non seulement ce qu'il ressentait, mais ce qu'il voulait dire, mais aussi euh, euh, comment ça se manifestait à travers son médium. Et pour moi, c'était vraiment euh, un, super, euh, un super projet. Et puis, merci beaucoup euh, pour l'invitation. Puis, cette expo est juste euh, essentielle, et c'est juste une expo euh, euh, majeure. Et, euh, et d'avoir une part, mais aussi minime que celle-ci, euh, dans, dans quelque chose d'aussi grand, c'est juste, euh, juste génial. Quoi. Oui, merci Diane. Bon, honnêtement, euh, c'est grâce à, à cette euh, démarche euh, que, je, que nous avons l'opportunité de travailler et connaître, euh, te connaître. Euh, ça nous fait énormément plaisir et euh, ça, ça agrandit un peu la famille. Quoi. Mm -hmm. Uh, je voulais pivoter, voir si Tamar, Tamar, are you around still? Are you connected with us still? Because Rick is here and I would love to... <laughs> for the, really for the moment, but it could change <laughs> any second. The baby is having trouble getting to sleep tonight. Okay. And bathing. <laughs> Mama had to do an intervention. I was halfway through the bath and the baby was strongly... Uh, They were requesting Mama's presence, so she came <laughs> in and saved me. But I might be called to duty soon. <laughs> Understood. Well, we miss you in Montreal, um, Tamara. Yeah, I really wish I could have been there to see the exhibition. And Rick is around. Hi, Tamara. Hey. How are you? Good. So <laughs> I should thank you again for conducting a very long interview. <laughs> Text in your car. You were in your car in a parking lot, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, very memorable. Uh, yeah, it was great. It was. Uh, I it was a great interview, and uh, thank you so much for taking the time to to do your writing. Mm -hmm. Your beautiful prose. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure. Such great work that tends to drag it out of people. The best prose they're capable of when the work is really good. I feel like you have the, the, the is it a ASMR voice that we were all looking for earlier? You have, <laughs> you have a good one too, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it was really nice. 
like a, a really delightful thing that that some that in this project we were able to bring artists and writers together who didn't necessarily know each other's work initially but then i don't know through through some kind of magic there was there were connections that were you know quite profound uh bef i also wanted to shout out to dominique dominique do you la toujours huh? Uh, yes, but I can't remove my video. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, mais écoute, on va, je voulais juste te, te saluer et te remercier euh, pour le texte que tu as fait pour Fairley Baez. Ouais, ouais c'était vraiment super et j'étais très heureuse de contribuer et puis d'écrire sur Fairley, euh, une artiste que j'admire et que dans le travail que je suis depuis un certain temps. Alors, euh, c'était une expérience euh, très fun et euh, très enrichissante. Et j'espère que le public, euh, les lecteurs euh, de la Fondation FI et d'ailleurs, vont aussi apprécier euh, le bonheur que j'ai eu euh, en traitant euh, de, du travail de Ferrelli. Merci. Et merci, Dominique. Um... You know, if Ed is still here, I, I think, you know, Ed's text was written by Paul Zitz. And it's a really wild text because the first, the first paragraph of it, I think it's about me. And I'm pretty sure Paul doesn't know me. And I'm not sure if Ed's still here. Oh, Johannes is, oh, hey, Ed, hey, Ed. <laughs> Hi. Well, Paul is uh, Johannes's brother, and uh, he's an award-winning poet, and he researches trauma, and I thought it would be interesting for him to tackle my work. So that's the text he came up with. And I, I was astounded to hear from you in person when I met you at FEE, that you felt that writing was actually based on you. It's incredible. <laughs> oh, he's in Calgary, right? <laughs> He's, he lives in Calgary. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I don't know where he is right now. I, I've been texting and emailing him, but I can't find him. You can see the show, show in me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he will. <laughs> he will be to. Now, I, I was very fortunate to have gone to the few twice to see the show. And the first time was just in the bigger space, and the second time in both spaces. And I, I have to say, it was such a privilege and pleasure and honor to be able to actually be witnessing all the works and experiencing the scale, the surface, the materiality in person. It, it was incredible. Uh, and I, it reminded me of me going to my chiropractor last week and she had to touch my hands. And she said, I can't believe I'm touching someone. And I felt that was the, that was the case. I felt it was more real than real because I was there. So yeah, it was, it was such a pleasure. And because of COVID, there were less people there. So it was like, Johannes and I had the, the spaces to ourselves when we were engaging with the work. So we took our time. There was no sense of hurrying or being disrupted by other people. It was a very beautiful experience. Well, it's uh, always, you know, a real pleasure to you know, work with you, be in your presence, and you know, thanks. Likewise. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's real, um, and I'm glad you got a chance to see to see it. And uh, thank Paul again for uh, uh, reaching into my soul. That was weird. <laughs> Yikes. Um, the, uh, we'll wrap it up soon, folks, but I just wanted to also say uh, thank you and, and to, to Tracy, who, who, you know, had the kindness of, of speaking to painting earlier, but, but Tracy wrote an incredibly beautiful text on Julie Moretti's work and, and Barty Kerr as well. And so thank you, Tracy. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to say about encountering, you know, these, these two incredible artists. Well, um, I, I would first just like to thank you and, and everyone uh, at FI. The, the whole experience for me was, it was so uh, positive. 
and just so kind of essential in, in the moment of just uh, feeling those kinds of really profound connections and, and being able to think about these, just being able to think about things other than kind of constant threat and being able to kind of, you know, parse the moment through that. And I'd also like to make a shout out to Edwin. Like I thought the copy edit editing was phenomenal and just, even those conversations were, uh, you know, were really enriching for me as well. And so I love all those, like all these articulations of the making. So the conversations to, with with the artists, with you, to see how the the, the book was designed, and I, it's just it's all really such a beautiful project. So I just would like to. Thank you for involving me in that. And I was one of the privileged few that actually got to see the show uh, in the space itself too. And as I said to Cheryl, there was just some really interesting conversations going on between the pieces and in the rooms. And I got to visit it with a painter friend. And so, you know, I saw it through those kinds of technical eyes too. So just, just a big thank you to, to everyone. Yeah, thanks for, for mentioning Edwin because, you know, it, it, you, when you're writing, it's the thing, you know, to have a copy editor come in and make some interesting comments. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot, and, and what it just does is it makes you think a little bit more about what it is you're really trying to say. And, and I really appreciate that. Um, I, I, I thank Edwin as well. Yeah, thanks for that, Tracy. And if, uh, uh, James, if you're still around, James wrote on on one of one of the artists who's no longer with us. He wrote about Barclay L. Hendricks. What was that like? Oh, James, yes, unmute man. Yeah, there we go. I mean, I I kind of I knew his work in passing. But I think what was essential is because he sort of was, uh, would he be like after Charles, he would be the oldest in the show? After, uh, after um, Frank Bowling. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Frank, then Yoko, then. Okay. So I think, I think for me, what was important is because, you know, like this, I, this theory of diaspora I'm developing is that there, there needs to be this sort of, um, linkages in the different constellations at different points of the constellation and with him i could make a really clear linkage uh through the idea of the cool and coolness and this idea which a lot of people uh may not be aware of comes up from from this west african cultures and literally means a cooling system um at the at once it means a sense of style so i think he he's an important crossroads uh between the continent, between uh, the, the motherland, and then between here, and then between a, a further thing, because um, because he you know because he's 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 able to be one of these cultural carriers of something that definitely still exists in West Africa, exists here, and um, also there's the the other thing about him is it, it's an important set of references because of the relationship to, to sort of like iconography right now like um, say the Instagrams and the, uh, the pose and, and the sort of um, the, the image that has become um, almost, um, 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 let's say, um, just um, proliferated of people, how they, so the selfie in a way, and how he could sort of treat this sort of um, uh, what might seem at once this kind of like um, selfie subjectivity, but find a different sort of mode of, of that, that existed in, in the 70s, right? And that he carried through to the present. So I think he's an important juncture, I think, between a lot of the constellations, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that really join us and really remind us about the different um, ligatures that exist in the diaspora, you know? Just like Rajni. Uh, Rajni is definitely one of those ligatures right now, uh, whether she likes it or not. She is one of the prime ones. <laughs> Um, you know, she's really another ligature between something from before, something in the future, something that maybe was not before, 
So I think there's key people in the show that are that are ligatures like that. And 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 Bet Barclay Hendricks is definitely one of those ligatures, just like Rad Rajni. Sort of like trans people who are documenting transversal characters hmm. and and documenting the trickster. Because really, you know, of course, Ed, we had this conversation. The the trickster is this prime figure in the diaspora, which we can't get rid of. Not just in the black diaspora, in all the diasporas. So Char um, Barclay really is that one of the people who document that character, that the person standing on the street corner, hmm. the person who has this influence when you go in a party, this person ex exudes something in the same way that Rajni is almost like creating these transversal characters that really are the people that really continue the voice of the diaspora, just like Ed's people in his paintings. So I don't know. That's hmm. my I love it. Mm -hmm. Girl, can I just say something? So, yep. James is saying reminds for for uh, the essay that I wrote on Julie Maritou, I saw I wrote on her painting Mambo Jumbo, and so it kind of triggered me to think of the Ismail Reed book Mambo Jumbo. And so much of what James, what you're saying, really resonates for me in in the form and content of, of that book too. Of all those kinds of you know of things crossing over things from the past and these kinds of these, these, these kind of terrifying something arriving and and that it's like it's kind of formless and it's it's you know, and anyway he's <laughs> just everything you said just really kind of resonated with with this book itself too yeah i have to read that book <laughs> i I don't think, is, are there any other writers cloaking themselves in some kind of, or artists, uh, you know, who are hiding behind the ubiquitous <laughs> Zoom user? <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> um, I, bonjour, Michael. I see that Michael is, Michael Sergil uh, is a, an artist based here in Montreal who, who um, has done an incredible, um, installation in response to the show for hello Clara. Ça va bien, merci toi. Oui, oui. <laughs> Écoute, uh, tu sais, je ne veux pas comme uh, um, te mettre uh, trop sur le spot, mais uh, tu sais, uh, comment ça va avec uh, l'installation en ce moment, étant donné qu'on peut voir à travers la fenêtre, en fait, pour voir l'installation. Oui, c'est ça, on peut l'avoir de, de l'extérieur, on ne peut pas y participer malheureusement vu les, les conditions actuelles, mais on est en collaboration aussi avec, euh, ben, on travaille avec euh, Daniel Fizet qui est en train de créer toute une vidéo pour pouvoir la diffuser puis faire en sorte que l'atelier devienne euh, un atelier virtuel aussi. Mais au moins on peut l'avoir de l'extérieur, c'est déjà ça. Oui, oui, et euh, on n'a pas réalisé à ce moment comment euh, les fenêtres seraient autant importantes pour donner les, les visiteurs une, la possibilité de voir l'installation. Donc, je pense qu'on va, on va mousser ça parce que on a besoin de l'art en ce moment et, et alors là, on peut voir ton installation. Donc, merci infiniment. Merci à vous. <rire> um, alors, je, je pense que ben, je voulais vous remercier. Thank you so much, everybody, for being with us for the launch of this, uh, this um, publication. We're really looking forward to sending, um, sending copies out to all the writers and artists and making it, you know, available to you. Uh, I think I think we're going to be able to have a, some point of, of sale. <laughs> For, for folks, um, and then otherwise, we're, we're, you know, for everyone who worked on it, you'll, you'll be receiving a little care package from the Phi Foundation. Um, this has been like a pretty, for all intents and purposes, a pretty awesome launch. I have to say, like having a chance to speak to people is the most difficult thing in, in any physical location type style launch. So I want to thank you. For being here and and I had a good time. I hope you did too. <laughs> it's fun. Hey, all right. Well, take good care. Lots of love from Montreal. Thank you for everybody's presence here and 
Let's stay together. I wish I had music to outro. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Big kisses. Bye bye. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, John.